Abomination Bolts Chapter 1 A Light in the Fog Content Warning While Abomination Bolts contains typical Pathfinder action and adventure, it also presents themes of suicide, ableism, body horror, and human experimentation. Before you begin, understand that player consent, including that of the Game Master, is vital to a safe and fun play experience for everyone. You should talk with your players before beginning and modify descriptions or scenarios as appropriate. Chapter 1 Synopsis The upper levels of the Abomination Vaults and the only level above ground is the ruin of a large structure called Gauntlight Keep. Although the upper levels of the keep have collapsed into the lower level, filling many of the remaining rooms with rubble, one prominent structure remains. Gauntlight, a massive lighthouse placed incongruously in the middle of a large swamp called the Fog Fen. Here the heroes can encounter hapless but vicious mythflits, dangers left from Belcora's day, and evidence that Gauntlight draws upon power from somewhere deep below. Environmental cues, crude graffiti, evidence of prior squatters, mounds of rubble, overgrowth of mold and creeping plants, Puddles of standing water, scuttling vermin, splashing water, swampy odors. Chapter 1 Treasure The permanent and consumable items available as treasures in Chapter 1 are as follows. A plus one morning star, a plus one rapier, a wand of heal first level. Black adder venom, caltrop snare. Channel Protection Amulet Lesser Comprehension Elixir Lesser Dark Vision Elixir Lesser Skeptics Elixir Minor Elixir of Life Minor Healing Potion Scroll of Restore Senses Spear Frog Poison Spike Snare Wolf Fang When the fog is creeping, and the moon is low, When the town is sleeping, gaunt light starts to glow. That's when she arises, for her midnight lunch. Naughty kids are prizes, for her teeth to crunch. But if you obey me, and obey the rules, You're safe from Belcora, she just eats the fools. So warns a popular nursery rhyme among the parents in the town of Atari, as they often sing the melodious but unsettling poem to their children at night to encourage good behaviour. As a result, everyone who grows up in Atari has a healthy mix of fear, respect and curiosity for the old ruins out in the fog fen and the strange lighthouse that stands at the swamp's heart. As they grow older, Townsfolk learn what's more often accepted as truth, that the heroic founders of Atari had slain the wicked sorcerer Belcora many years ago. For a time, thrill-seekers explored the ruins around the lighthouse called Gauntlight. But today, common knowledge holds that the place has become a haven for pests, no longer a source of active danger or significant treasure after being completely picked over. Nearly 500 years has passed since Belcora's defeat after all, and in that time, she has only posed a menace to Atari through sinister rhymes. Or so the citizens of Atari believe. While many old legends about Belcora are true, she did practice cannibalism, for example, but didn't limit her diet to foolish children. The belief that she's no longer a danger is false. Two years ago, on the 500th anniversary of the most significant event of her life, her family's exile from Absalom for abhorrent rites, Belcora's spiteful ghost awoke deep beneath Gauntlight Keep. The lighthouse and surrounding ruins presents only the highest level of a vast complex Belcora stocked with malicious and malignant creatures. Her abomination vaults. Belcora's spite has festered in the intervening centuries, and she hungers for revenge, not only against Absalom for destroying her family, but also the town of Atari and its founders, the heroes who killed her. 
Belcora bides her time while she rebuilds, re-energizing the dread Gauntlight and reasserting her dominance over the feral and forgotten monsters of the Abomination Vaults. Sidebar, beyond Gauntlight. The ruins of Gauntlight Keep aren't far out of town, just a 20 minute walk from Atari to the ruins. The Abomination Vault's adventure path focuses almost entirely on the dungeon itself, and you can gloss over the details of trips between the dungeon and town as you see fit. If your players express interest in mixing things up, you can use some of the encounters or short adventures in the standalone Pathfinder adventure, Troubles in Atari. That adventure presents additional content in the Atari hinterlands suitable for second to fourth level characters and provides a great way to prepare heroes who need a bit of extra experience points before they delve into deeper, more dangerous levels of the Abomination Bolts. Getting Started The Abomination Bolts adventure path focuses primarily on the sprawling dungeon complex, and this campaign begins as the heroes approach the above-ground ruins for the first time. Their mutual friend, Rin Savinzi, has already briefed them about her sightings of a strange glow atop the ruins' towering lighthouse. From Atari, no one other than Rin can make out this glow, but if the heroes look up at night from the immediate environs, they can confirm what Rin's supernaturally acute eyes picked out from the town. The top of the lighthouse does indeed glow a faint, eerie blue after dark. Of course, you don't have to start this campaign on the literal front porch of the dungeon. If you wish, you can ease the heroes by role-playing their initial encounter with Rin, perhaps as she gives them an astrology reading, or after the heroes spend time in the town involving some last-minute shopping or a trip to the tavern. But the fun doesn't truly begin until the heroes head up the gaunt trail to the foreboding ruins in the Fogfen. Gauntlight Ruin Features as the heroes approach the ruins of Gauntlight Keep for the first time, describe the following. The sounds of frogs and mosquitoes mixes with water sloshing against muddy shores, all muffled by the ever-present mists that linger in the aptly named Fogfen. As the mist clears, a shadow looms from the cloying swamp vapours. A sprawling ruin of stone and wood squats atop an island in the soggy marsh. The upper floors have largely collapsed, leaving only the stone walls of the ground floor intact. Above these ruins towers an out-of-place monument, a colossal lighthouse whose painted walls and iron cast crown have resisted the corrosive effects of the surrounding swamp. While the overgrown trail leads right to Area A1, the heroes can access the ruins through other entrances. Along the southern side, Waters surrounding the ruins are relatively shallow, but on the other sides, the depth ranges from 10 to 15 feet, requiring a boat or swimming to navigate. With the exception of Gauntlight in Area A25, the upper levels of Gauntlight Keep collapsed long ago, even falling to the ground floor in places. Areas denoted as rubble on the map of Gauntlight Keep are open to the sky above and considered difficult terrain. Where the roof hasn't caved in, ceilings are 10 feet high unless otherwise noted. The only illumination comes from whatever sunlight filters in through the constant fog. The doors on this level are all cracked and rotten, except where indicated. Handling them with any amount of force causes them to split or simply fall off their hinges with a wet splintering sound. Gauntlight is magically protected from damage. This protection has bled into the surrounding ruins somewhat slowing the usual rate of decay of the past 500 years. Nevertheless, time is inexorable, and the rest of the ruins have suffered the passage of centuries. The main faction active in the ruins is what's left of a small gang of Mitflitz gremlins, who called themselves the Mudlickers. Led by a large bearded gremlin named Boss Gronk, the Mudlickers believe they once dwelt in glory underground. However, the arrival of much larger and meaner Ghost Queen Morlocks forced them out of their home, and they've struggled to regain their footing ever since. Boss Grong has thus far formed the inkling of a plan to raise an army of giant insects to take over Atari. He has already exuberantly guaranteed the restoration of Mudlicker glory through this scheme, 
so the gang loyally follows Boss Grong, working hard to keep intruders, like the heroes, out of their ruins. As a reminder, you should take note of what the players have their characters generally do as they explore. You can have them choose from the list of exploration activities in the Pathfinder Core rulebook, or you can ask each player to describe what their character does and decide which exploration activity best fits their description. Certain effects are listed in the rooms based on whether a hero is investigating, searching, or performing another exploration activity. Area A1 – Damp Entrance – A Low Level 1 Encounter Swaths of mildew and mould cover the damp surfaces of this watchtower, appearing as green and black smears on the dull stone walls. The door frames in the walls of the north and the south rotted long ago, while a few collapsed chairs lie on the floor amid heaps of foul-smelling grey lumps. Thick sheets of dusty cobwebs hang from above, obscuring any view of the ceiling. Once the primary entrance to Gauntlight Keep, this one-story outbuilding is constructed of sturdy stone. The opaque sheets of dusty cobwebs function as a drop ceiling at a height of seven feet, leaving a three-foot space between the cobwebs and the stone ceiling above. The mud liquor mitflits have rigged a slipshod network of soggy ropes and planks in the spaces above the cobwebs to clamber around on. A successful DC-12 perception check can spot this feature through the webbing, and a critical success also reveals a three-foot diameter hole in the roof in the northwest corner which the gremlins use to come and go. A successful DC-15 nature check to recall knowledge identifies the deposits of grey material as mitflit dung. Apparently, the mitflits use this room as a latrine as well as an advanced guard station. Creatures. Three mitflits lurk above the cobwebs, but can't resist a chance to torment and trick the heroes once they enter the room below. By crouching down on the planks and vines, and peering through the cobwebs, the three mitflits wait until at least two heroes have entered the room below before calling out their best imitation of a high-pitched pixie voice. They welcome the heroes into their parlour and warn them about the mean bugs that live in the nearby keep, and suggest the visitors partake of magic pixie mud on the floor. Of course, the fact that the mitflits lack any skills at lying, they have a negative one deception modifier, and can only speak an undercommon means that they have a slim chance of success. But if they do, they're overcome with gorse of laughter and can't help but reveal their presence. If confronted, either the heroes spot them or fail to fall for their tricks. The mitflits shriek in anger and fear. One of them clambers up through the hole in the roof and tries to climb across the vine stretching from area A1 to A9 to warn his boss in area A10, while the other two throw darts at the heroes. As soon as any mitflit takes damage, they shriek in fear, cast bane, and then flee to area A9. The mitflits keep a nasty-smelling chunk of giant maggot meat handy for a snack, but if forced to flee, one tosses the maggot steak into the shore of the pool in area A3, hoping to cover their retreat by luring Slurk living there to the shore to attack the heroes. Treasure Searching the room reveals a peridot bead, one of the misflits thought it was candy, worth two gold pieces, along with the chipped mitflit tooth in one of the little dung piles. Sidebar, Wandering Monsters. While this book doesn't present wandering monster tables for abomination vaults, the dungeon's denizens still occasionally leave their homes. You can make the dungeon feel more dynamic by familiarizing yourself with each level's denizens and then having them react to the party's progression and presence. For example, if the heroes noisily explore an area, creatures in nearby rooms could come investigate or perhaps set up an ambush. If the heroes decide to camp out in the dungeon rather than return to the safety of the town, nearby creatures might visit or even attack their campsite while they rest. If the heroes clean out the denizens of a level and then return weeks later, they might find that new monsters have moved in. By keeping the inhabitants of the Abomination Vaults active, you can make the location feel all the more dangerous and unpredictable to your players. Area A2 – Decrepit Drawbridge A wooden drawbridge, its timbers grey with age and decay, 
spans this 20-foot gap between the outbuilding and the sprawling ruins on the island. Rusty iron chains hang from the ruins' northern wall to the drawbridge's southern side. The chains look ready to fall apart, giving the drawbridge's structural integrity an extra layer of dubiousness. True to appearances, the drawbridge isn't safe to cross, especially now that the Mitflits have further weakened the structure with some clever undercutting to its supports. The heroes can spot the sabotage with a successful DC-5 perception check. A small or smaller creature can cross the bridge safely, but medium creatures must cross one at a time, or the bridge collapses with a groaning crash, which dumps everyone on the bridge into the four foot deep water. A creature near the end of the drawbridge can grab an edge with a DC-10 reflex save to avoid falling in. Once the bridge has collapsed, a character can attempt a DC-10 athletics check to climb up to area A1 or A4 on either side. Of course, once the bridge collapses, the slurks in Area A3 quickly come to investigate. Area A3, Slurk Pon, a low level 1 encounter. Tangles of reeds grow in thick clusters around the edge of this muddy pond. The water appears murky with algae, and the half-decayed body of a 3 foot tall scaly humanoid lies in the pool's northern bank, half buried in mud and leaves. The water of this pond is only four feet deep, but an extra few feet of mud below makes it greater difficult terrain to wade through. Vines and creepers festoon the ruins, but any hero investigating this area who succeeds at a DC-12 nature check to recall knowledge identifies an unusually long vine that seems out of place. This vine stretches from the top of the watchtower in area A1 to the north end of the walkway to the northeast in area A9. The Mitflitch strung up this vine so they could avoid the ground if they wanted to. It won't support any creature larger than small in size. Creatures A single slurk, the former guardian and only surviving remnant of the stone scale kobolds who recently dwelt in the ruins, still lives at this pond. The Mitflitz enjoy playing Dodge the Squirt as they taunt the slurk into spitting slime at them when they dash across the vine. The slurk prefers to sleep in the center of the pond with its snout above the water during the day, then flops out at night to hunt. Loud noises, such as a collapsing drawbridge, and the scent of sudden free food, such as a tossed maggot steak, or anyone splashing around on the pool's edge, will rouse the slurk from its slumber. Once woken, the monster eagerly attacks any creatures nearby, but it doesn't leave sight of its pond. The creature fights to the death. Treasure the corpse of a dead kobold lies on the pond's north bank. The slurk avoided eating the carcass out of lingering loyalty to the recently slaughtered tribe, and the slurk's present kept the mitflits from looting it, but not from eyeing it covetously from afar. The gear on the kobold's body is mostly ruined with the exception of four gold pieces in one rotten belt pouch, and a spike snare bundled securely in a little backpack. Area A4 Maggot Training Hall, a moderate level 1 encounter. Piles of rotting timbers and loose stones lie in heaps throughout this large L-shaped hall. Clumps of moss and tangled vines spill down from gaps in the wooden ceiling above each pile of rubble. Several doors lead out to all sides, most barely clinging to their hinges and frames. Debris completely block the wooden stairwell that leads up to a large hole in the ceiling. Here and there, the stone walls bear the scars of fire or damage from an ancient battle. Many years ago, the Rose Guard confronted Belcora in this vast room. The fight spilled out from here into the Servant's Lounge, now a sinkhole in Area A8, and caused some of the keep's collapse. A hero investigating this room, who succeeds at a DC-15 check to recall knowledge, using any skill associated with magic, confirms that powerful destructive spells caused some of the damage centuries ago. Most of the doors in this room are easy enough to access, with a couple of exceptions. The door to area A11 requires a successful DC-18 athletics check to force open, and Rubble has mostly buried the door to area A14. Characters can try to clamber over the piles of rubble, through a hole in the roof, and down into the room beyond with a successful DC-10 athletics check. 
A secret door opens into a small hidden alcove to the northwest. A hero searching this room who succeeds at a DC 20 perception check finds a section of the stone wall that slides aside to access it. The alcove beyond the door has several grooves in the stone, caused by what looks to be determined scraping. This chamber used to contain a teleportation circle to area C5A, but fortune hunters found this hidden alcove centuries ago and gouged out all the silver in the magic runes. The extensive damage drained away the magic and permanently destroyed the teleportation circle. A hero who succeeds at a DC-18 arcana or occultism check to recall knowledge realizes the original purpose of this room and the permanent damage done. This room foreshadows many other teleportation circles in the abomination bolts that the heroes will be able to reactivate and use. Creatures When the Mitflits dwelled in the dungeons below, they numbered in the dozens, but their violent eviction by the Morlocks, attritions from games of Dodge the Squirt, and misjudge vermin empathy have diminished the group. Originally, all the Mudlickers lived in this large room. Now only three Mitflits remain here. The Mudlicker leader, Boss Skrom, has an audacious plan. After discovering the giant maggots in Area A5 and the giant fly in Area A6, he ordered his Mitflits to start training and breeding more maggots. Once the insects have fully grown, he intends on leading his entire group, mounted on trained giant fly war steeds down to Atari to raid and rule. Three Mitflits are currently engaged in training their first maggot. Hoping the pallid creature retains its training after it matures into a giant fly. None of the gremlins know how long it takes for a maggot to grow up big and strong. But upon sighting the heroes, they immediately order their pet forward to attack. After all, giant fly war steeds need to develop a taste for people to grow up nice and mean. Area A5. Maggot Stable. A low level 1 encounter. A collapsed wooden staircase in the northeastern corner of this room winds up to a moss-shrouded hole. The expanse of the fog fen is visible through a total collapse in a stone wall to the west. A dead frog the size of a horse lies sprawled in this collapse, its back legs bitten off at the hips. This massive frog was attacked by Fresnelkesh, the river drake who lairs in area B19. The drake decided she had no interest in the frog's foul toxic skin after gnawing off its legs. The carcass lies in the rubble on the western wall. Creatures While the river drake didn't find the frog's flavor appetizing, the giant maggots deposited into the carcass by the giant fly in area A6 aren't so discerning. If any creature approaches within 10 feet of the frog's body, two giant maggots burst suddenly from the carcass to attack. They pursue fresh food relentlessly and fight to the death. Examining the frog. A hero who investigates the frog carcass and succeeds at a DC-18 arcana or nature check to recall knowledge can tell that a draconic creature ate the frog's legs. On a critical success, the heroes recognize the caustic mucus around the bite as belonging to a river drake. Area A6. Fly pen. A moderate level 1 encounter. The interior of this watch post has a wooden ceiling high above, but a thick mound of filth and animal carcasses heaped on the floor make this room anything but inviting. This room's ceiling is 15 feet high and has a trap door leading onto a small parapet that survived the manor's collapse. A hero who succeeds at a DC-18 perception check can spot the trap door, which can't be easily seen. With the ladder gone, a character must succeed on a DC-15 athletics check to climb the trap door. Under Boss Grong's orders, the Mitflits captured a cornerstone of their plan to rule Atari, a magnificent green and blue fly the size of a pony that the gremlins call Buzzy Buzz. They keep it here believing the fly can't escape the room and the Mitflits don't know about the trap door, but their fly prisoner found it right away. Buzzy Buzz can leave whenever it wants, but the food in the area keeps it satisfied here. In fact, this room is slightly too convenient, as a second giant fly with a brown and blue coloration sometimes comes in too. The two giant flies get along with one another, since they both have plenty of food. However, the Mitflits have never seen both in the room at the same time, 
So Boss Gronk and his followers believe there's only one giant fly. They don't understand why Buzzy Buzz seems to change colour from time to time. Creatures The heroes first encounter the green and blue giant fly when they enter the room. It lunges at the heroes, assuming that they're more food. One round later, the brown and blue fly darts into the room through the trap door and joins in the attack. Any mitflits that see both flies at the same time become visibly confused, but their surprise turns to horror when they see the giant flies fight to the death. Area A7 Dining Room A low level 1 encounter The collapsed ceiling in the middle of this room has left a ragged hole in the wooden roof. Rotten tapestries, their designs completely obscured by mould, hang in tatters on the walls between the arrow slits and the ruined side tables. The remains of a fancy dining table lie mostly pulverised by a fallen ceiling. Hazard Not all the haunts plaguing Gauntlight are direct echoes of Belcora's legacy. This room served as a communal hall for the stone scale kobolds before a violent coup tore apart the group. The kobold spirits linger here to this day. This might be the first haunt the heroes face in the Abomination Vault's adventure path. You should do your best to describe the ghostly kobolds that rise from the rubble, not as monsters to be fought in a traditional manner, but as a spectral phenomenon that must be dealt with another way. You might try to lead the heroes into trying skills most likely to quell the haunt. Intimidation to scare away the kobold ghosts, or religion to put their spirits back to rest. This is a good opportunity to get the players in the mindset that haunts are often more like puzzles that need to be solved, rather than a foe to be vanquished. And getting the heroes into the mindset of understanding why a haunt is here in the first place. Understanding how a haunt came to be is the best way to discover how to put it to rest. Stone Scale Spirits is a level 2 hazard and a complex haunt. A half dozen ghostly kobolds rise from the rubble in a howling vortex. Treasure with a successful DC-20 perception check, heroes searching this room find many tiny bones scattered in the rubble. 30 minutes of work can uncover six kobold skeletons. Destroying the bones or removing them all from this room permanently disables the haunt. A hero who's trained in religion or who succeeds at a DC-15 religion check realizes the connection between the bones and the haunt and understands that destroying the bones or removing all from the rubble pile is necessary to ensure the spectral kobolds won't ever rise again. If the heroes discover the kobolds' bones, they also find several jumbled treasures, three gold pieces, twenty silver pieces, a box with components for a cowtrop snare, a wolf fang, and a vial of black adder venom with the words YUM clumsily written on it. Area A8 Sinkhole, a moderate level 1 encounter. Roll a secret DC 10 perception check for each hero before they enter this room to hear the sound of high-pitched squeals and shrieks from within. Any hero who specifically listens before entering hears these sounds automatically. The four mitflits goofing off in this room are the source of the noise. Almost the entire ceiling of this room has collapsed, while below the floor has crumbled into a 10-foot deep sinkhole filled with rubble, mud, and glistening patches of fungus. Evidence of ancient damage, burn scars and acid scorch marks decorate the walls and much of the rubble. The ancient battle between the Rose Guard and Belcora came to its destructive end in this room, when Belcora used a last-ditch explosion to try to defeat the adventurers. The resulting collapse swallowed the group's rogue, Otari Ilvashti, and trapped him in the dungeon below. Belcora fled to the lighthouse in Area A11 after this failed gambit. As in Area A4, a hero investigating this room, who succeeds at a DC-15 check to recall knowledge using any skill associated with magic, confirms a devastating magical battle occurred here long ago. A character must attempt a DC-12 athletics check to climb to navigate the sinkhole's deep slopes. A hero who searches the rubble and succeeds at a DC-18 perception check spies a buried spiral staircase leading downward. Clearing the rubble away can take many days, but if the heroes persist, they open the way down to area B8 below. Creatures Four mudlicker mitflits clamber and scurry around amid the rubble in the sinkhole. 
They're supposed to be gathering mushrooms and grubs, but are currently wrestling out over who gets to snack on a particularly bright blue grub. The Mintflits take a negative 2 penalty to perception checks to roll for initiative as a result of their distraction, unless the hero take pains to announce themselves before attacking. The Mitflits hurl darts at the heroes from below, but a Mitflit who runs out of darts or takes any damages focuses on climbing out of the pit and then running away to warm Boss Skrong in Area A10. Area A9 Walkway A 15-foot stone walkway spans a narrow stretch of swamp water, connecting a ruined keep to a large stone outbuilding. Double doors block each end of the walkway, Standing before the southeast door is a seven-foot-tall skeleton dressed in armor made of gnarled roots, bones, and rusted metal. The skeleton clenches a morning star in one weathered hand, with the weapon's heavy spiked tip resting on the walkway at the skeleton's feet. The skeletal guard is nothing more than a statue built by the mudlickers. It looks frightening, but poses no danger. Anyone examining the statue who succeeds at a DC-12 perception check notices the wooden struts and crude lashings that keep it together. Any damage dealt to the skeleton causes it to clatter apart loudly, alerting occupants in Area A-10. Treasure The Midflits found the Morning Star and are delighted with how well it keeps the skeleton propped up. They don't know it's a plus one Morning Star. Area A-10 Mud Licker Throne Room a severe level 1 encounter. Splintered framing in the ceiling and the floor hint that a thin wooden wall once divided this stone building's interior. With those walls demolished, only a single large chamber remains. Rubble, swamp vegetation, and mud pile in heaps like foul nests, while a larger stack of rubble, sticks, and bones looks almost but not quite like a throne. A flattened mound of sand with a few dozen bits of wooden stone stuck into it covers the floor before the throne. The Midflits chose these old barracks for their commander, Boss Skrong, who uses it as a throne hall. Boss Skrong's fragile throne requires constant upkeep, a task two Midflits perform when they aren't sleeping in the filthy nests here. Any hero looking at the sand mound in front of the throne can attempt a DC-10 society check to realize it represents a crude map of Atari. On a critical success, the hero notes several arrows that indicate plans of attack from the direction of the fog fen. Creatures Boss Skrong is always here, splitting his time between berating other mudlickers within earshot, playing with his pet giant Solifugid, Bite Bite, sleeping on his throne, or planning attacks on Atari on his sand pile. If Boss Skrull knows about the heroes in the vicinity, he sits on his throne at attention with Bite Bite at his side, ready to address them. Boss Skrull knew that it was only a matter of time before the heroes from Atari challenged him in his domain, but he seemed surprised that it happened before he actually did anything in the town. Unlike the other Mitflits, Boss Skrull speaks common, and he imperiously demands to know why the heroes have come to bother him before he attacked Atari. If he realizes the heroes didn't come to confront him, he pathetically backpedals, insisting that he has no plans to attack and that he's harmless and friendly. He punctuates this reversal by using his trident to scatter the map of Atari at his feet. Canny heroes who can lie to Boss Skrong about their reasons for being here can talk to him and perhaps find out what he knows about the Gauntlight Keep. But it doesn't take long before Boss Skrong's negligible bravery and greater impatience prompts him to begin the assault on Atari by attacking the heroes. If combat breaks out, Boss Skrong orders his minions into melee, but he hangs back to use his blowgun from behind cover of his throne. At the end of each of Boss Skrong's turns, the throne shakes and shudders dangerously, it doesn't collapse unless a hero damages it. The throne has an AC of 10, with a hardness of 2 and 3 hit points. If the throne collapses, Boss Skrong becomes flustered. He immediately falls prone and must spend at least one action during each of his next three turns, spluttering and cursing in undercommon. Boss Skrong gives up and begs for mercy if he's reduced to 5 or fewer hit points, but his followers fight to the death to demonstrate their devotion to Boss Skrong while he lives. What Boss Skrong knows. If the heroes can get Boss Skrong to talk, 
He has useful information. He knows about all the dangers in area A1 to A10, the giant scorpion in A14, and the swamp dragon that lives under the boathouse in area A16. He knows about the bogies in the keep, warning the heroes about the haunts in area A7, and the glowing ghosts in area A15. He never visited the outbuilding on the island to the northwest, but mentions that a boat full of people, whom he can describe as big and sneaky looking, came to visit a week ago. The visitors went into the swamp dragon's cave while the dragon was out, but the dragon returned soon thereafter. Boss Grong assumes the people got eaten. If asked about the Gauntlight's eerie glow, Boss Grong's eyes get big, and he shakes his head, warning the heroes that the light is the creepiest haunting of them all. He confirms that every night the light glows, and he worries that there may be a big ghost up there. Boss Grong also confirms that the mudlickers used to live in a dungeon level beneath the Gauntlight Keep, but a bunch of mushroom-eyed people, Morlocks, although the Mitflits don't know them by that name, chased them up here many nights ago. Boss Grong can provide a crude map of the first level, and a partial map of the second if the heroes can successfully request or coerce a favour from him, and supply him with the means to write out a map. A bribe of at least two gold pieces automatically gets Boss Grong feeling helpful enough to provide these maps. His map of the first level omits area A12 to A13, areas A19 to A23, and area A25, and all of the secret doors. His map of the second level obviously much less complete. It only shows the areas once dwelt in by the mudlickers, areas B8 to B14, and areas B16 to B19, although he warns the heroes that a big swamp dragon lives in the cave at area B19. Side quest. Boss Skronk hates the mushroom-eyed people and promises the heroes a big pile of shiny gems if they go downstairs, kill them all, and defeat their king. He describes the king as a magic priest mushroom eye guy who can hurt your brain just by looking at you. Boss Skronk doesn't actually have any shiny gems, and if the heroes do his quest and return with proof, he realises that the heroes are tougher than the Morlocks, and that he made a terrible mistake in promising them treasure he doesn't have. He instead throws himself at their mercy, and agrees to abandon his plots against Atari forever. Area A11, Gauntlight Base, a moderate level 1 encounter. The heroes find the southern door to this room stuck, but a character can attempt a DC-18 athletics check to force it open. Once opened, it falls to sodden pieces. The western door has a one-foot square window set with iron bars. It opens normally. The smooth walls of this circular room are painted with a light grey, with no indication of seams between the blocks of stone. A set of iron stairs winds up along the curved walls, before terminating at a trap door in the ceiling, nearly a hundred feet above. A red bloodstain glistens on the floor in the room's centre, as though a human-sized creature bled to death on the floor very recently, despite there being no body in sight. The Rose Guard finally defeated Belcora in this room nearly five centuries ago. As she died, Belcora's spirit was drawn into the depths of the Abomination Vaults through Gauntlight but the bloodstain she left on the floor remains as fresh as the day she died. During daylight hours, the fresh blood ripples occasionally. Its slick red surface appears like the top of a deep pool, but it's harmless despite its eerie movement. At night, the bloodstain acts as a hazard described further ahead. The iron stairs creak and sway alarmingly, but a quiet sound. As part of Gauntlight's structure, the stairs can't take damage as long as Belcora's ghost remains active. The stairs wind up 90 feet to a locked bronze trap door leading to the cupola in area A25. A hero can pick the lock to open the trap door with four successful DC-25 thievery checks or can use the key hidden in area A13. Hazard. This haunt can activate only at night. A hero who has seen a depiction of Belcora elsewhere in the Abomination Vaults 
can recognize the haunt's appearance. Otherwise, a successful DC-20 society check confirms her identity. Blood of Belcora, a level 3 hazard and a complex haunt. A bloody image of Belcora arises, emits a soul-draining light, then inhales blood from living creatures in the room. Area A-12, Belcora's office. The ceiling has collapsed in the southwest corner of this room. The walls bear several shelves, but books and papers once kept here have rotten to ruin long ago due to exposure to the elements, as have the wooden desk and chair in the alcove to the northeast. The hero searching this room who succeeds at a DC-20 perception check locates the secret door in the east wall, where a rotating shelf functions as the door's handle. Beyond a flight of stairs leads down to area B6. Treasure. A hero searching the desk automatically notes a hidden drawer that has fallen partially open, revealing a few still potent alchemical elixirs Belcora stashed here. A lesser comprehension elixir, a minor elixir of life, and a lesser skeptic's elixir. Area A13, Belcora's Sanctum. This triangular room might have once seemed comfortable, but after years of rain and exposure to the elements, through two arrow slits in the northeastern wall, the room's divan, amour, and tapestries have fallen into decay. Belcora maintained this private room to relax and constructed a secret entrance to the shrine to easily access it. A rusted ring of keys sits under the divan, and any hero searching this room finds it. Rust has ruined six of the iron keys, but two bronze keys remain usable. One decorated with a lighthouse unlocks the trap door to Gauntlight's cupola in area A25, and the other is decorated with the book that unlocks the door to Belcora's private reading room in area C27. A tapestry formerly concealed a secret door, but it rotted and fell long ago so the door has become slightly easier to find. A hero searching this room who succeeds at a DC-16 perception check locates the secret door that leads into a small area that connects to the shrine. Characters can obviously spot the second partly ajar secret door within this space, as described in Area A-15. Area A-14, Scorpion Kennel, a moderate level 1 encounter. The ceiling of this room has fallen in two places. A smaller collapse destroyed a flight of stairs that once led up to the now ruined upper floor. A larger collapse mostly buried the southern double door, leaving a hole in the roof partially blocked with several cross timbers. A second double door to the north has a stone face carved with skulls caked with a tangle of moss. This room serves as a kennel for the mudlicker's first significant acquisition a giant scorpion. The Mitflits lured the monster into this room with minimal loss, then collapsed several timbers in the rubble to keep it penned in. A medium or smaller creature can clamber through this tangle, but unless it's significantly tormented, the giant scorpion won't think to smash through the timbers to leave this room. Although the tangles of moss growing on the skull carving seem to be part of the overgrowth prevalent throughout the ruins, they belong to the original design. The mossy skull is a religious symbol of Nimbraloth, the outer god of ghosts, despair, swamps, and will-o'-wisps, whom Belcora reveres as her patron. Nimbraloth's lore is rare and hidden, however, so a hero must succeed at a DC-25 religion check to recall knowledge to identify the mossy skull as Nimbraloth's symbol. Although fledgling heroes might not recognize evidence of Nimbraloth, Rin Savinzi in town knows the sinister outer god and can enlighten their heroes if they report their findings to her. Creatures. The Mitflits keep the giant scorpion well fed and content, but it attacks other creatures at once. It can skitter easily over the rubble in this room and doesn't treat it as difficult terrain. The scorpion can climb the rubble to the south and force open a path to pursue the heroes with a successful DC-18 athletics check if necessary but it's unlikely to do so unless attackers are harrying it from the other side of the rubble. The scorpion is a particularly dangerous foe for first level characters, so you might encourage the heroes to retreat if they're having a hard time with it, and have the scorpion retreat back to the room rather than pursuing fleeing heroes very far. Area A15, 
Nimbaloth Shrine, a severe level 1 encounter. The air in this large chapel feels colder and damper than elsewhere in the ruins. Condensed beads on the wall run into rivulets across the countless skulls carved into the stone. A mouldering human corpse lies slumped against a wall, his hand wedged into a crack as if he died trying to pry a brick loose. Three short flights of steps lead upward to a wider chamber to the north, where a semicircular dais supports an altar of white stone. Beyond the altar loom four stained glass windows, each twenty feet tall and depicting four haunting scenes of ghosts rising from overgrown graveyards towards a four-pointed orange star high above. Belcora made no secret of her faith in Nimbraloth, and she maintained this sizable shrine to the sinister entity, both as a place of worship and an intimidating setting to meet visitors. The shrine has an ominous atmosphere, as if something immense and distant watches through stained glass windows. A hero can identify this room as a shrine to Nimbraloth with a successful DC-25 religion check to recall knowledge. The corpse to the south lies slumped next to a secret door leading to area A13. Once a human man, this thief snuck into the temple through the secret door from area A13 months ago in search of treasure, only to find himself outclassed by the corpse lights lurking in this room. He perished just before he could reopen the secret door to escape from them. The thief left the door slightly ajar with the rotating skull that opens it still slightly turned so the heroes can easily spot the secret door. Creatures, two long dead acolytes of Nimbaloth, have decomposed into little more than mossy skeletons, sprawled along the eastern edge of the large chamber to the north. Initially out of sight of anyone entering from the south, they're far from harmless however, as they harbour eerie creatures called corpse lights. The corpse lights rise when the heroes approach the northern chamber, they fight until destroyed, but don't pursue heroes who flee. The first corpse light to fall and be reduced to its wisp form animates the corpse of the dead thief at the secret door, if it's still available, or in an even darker turn, a dead hero. Treasure. The thief's corpse had several items of value, including a plus one rapier, four daggers, a silver ring worth five gold pieces, a minor healing potion, and a lesser dark vision elixir. The acolyte skeletons have little remains that haven't rotted or rusted away to uselessness, with two exceptions. One of them has a gold tooth worth four gold pieces still in its jaw, while the other acolyte wears a channel protection amulet around its bony neck. A hero searching the altar who succeeds at a DC-18 perception check finds a secret panel in its northern side, which has a shallow nook that contains a scroll of restore senses, and a first level wand of heal. Area A16, Ruined Boathouse. A hero who takes a close look at the doors to this boathouse notices that one of them has been forced open and then carefully closed again within the past couple of weeks. The southern portion of this stone-walled building has collapsed into rubble, exposing what remains of a boathouse to the elements. The shelves and boats within have decayed into heaps of rot and moss. The remains of a relatively fresh campfire smolder faintly. The campfire's remains hint at the presence of a group of thieves from Atari, a band from Crook's Nook who came here several days ago after hearing rumours of treasure stashed in a cavern under the island. They entered Area B-19 below only to get in over their heads when they were trapped in the dungeon and imprisoned by some of the Ghost Queen Morlocks there. Area A-17 Ruined Pier much of this wooden pier has collapsed into the swamp, leaving about 10 feet of mouldy soggy boards slumped against ancient wooden pilings. A rowboat tied to a piling looks much more recently built. The rowboat left here by the Crook's Nook thieves is in good condition. The heroes can use it to navigate the waters around the ruins, and heroes searching the rowboat find two things. The first is a stash of pastries, smoked salmon in a fish-shaped doughy exterior. A hero who succeeds at a DC-12 society check recognises the fish cakes as those sold at the Crook's Nook in Atari. The second is a carving of a flying bird decorating the inside of the boat near the bow. A hero who succeeds at a DC-16 society check 
recognizes that this mark belongs to the Osprey Club, Atari's Thieves Guild. A critical success confirms that the Osprey Club uses Crook Nook as headquarters, and that Guild members bear the mark of the Flying Bird as a tattoo. If the heroes come here after dark, the Flicker Wisp in Area A24 flickers in an attempt to lure them in closer. An opening under the pier leads to Area B19. At your discretion, the River Drake Fresnelkesh might venture out to hunt in the Fog Fen and spot the heroes while they're nearby. Fresnelkesh is a difficult foe for a party of first level characters, so you should have the River Drake take off to pursue larger safer prey in the swamp if the heroes are having a tough time dealing with her. Side quest. Should the heroes visit Crook's Nook and ask about the boat, Yin Yasmira admits that four of her employees went missing several days ago. She promises a 50 gold piece reward if the heroes can find out what happened to them and bring them back. One thief died in Area B14, and the Morlocks have kept the other three as prisoners in Area B24. Area A18, Apprentice Island. A low wooden bridge spans a watery gap between the larger island and a smaller one. A single story building sits amid the thick reeds growing on the smaller island. The building on this islet originally served as the home of Belcora's apprentice, a drone named Volok Arezne. Volok no longer lives here, but he still serves Belcora in the chambers deep below, having transcended from the limitations of his humanoid form to become a worm that walks. He now resides in Area D8. Area A19, Spooky Wisp, a trivial level 1 encounter. The exterior door to this room is stuck, requiring a successful DC-15 athletics check to force open. This study features several bookshelves, a desk and two chairs. The books and objects lie here in disarray with torn pages strewn haphazardly across the room. Volok once pursued his studies and met with Belcora for lessons in this room. Creatures Today, a mischievous brownie named Tangletop, a puckish fay whose epitonous blonde hair stays in a constant state of frizzy disarray on his head, occupies this chamber. Despite his comical appearance, Tangletop fancies himself something of a spooky sort of fay. As soon as he notices the heroes approaching, such as if they try to force open the door but don't succeed at doing it right away, he quickly slips into hiding under the desk before using ventriloquism to call out in a deep voice. He claims to be a dangerous wispy ghost named Spooky Wisp. He uses dancing lights to create what he hopes the heroes believe is a willow wisp, floating the light up in the air and using ventriloquism to cast his voice from the light. Tangletop arrived here only a few days ago, but he made short work of ripping through the room's contents before finding nothing of interest to him. He moved on towards Area A23. There, the shiny spyglass entranced him before the soulbound doll that guards it chased him off. Faced with an actually scary creature, Tangletop retreated to this room to plot methods of securing the shiny for himself. The heroes give him that method. If the heroes attack or confront him with violence, Tangletop shrieks in fear and flees towards Area A23 hoping to lure the heroes into that room so that they inadvertently end up destroying the Soulbound doll. If they do, he tries to steal the shiny therein before fleeing the area forever. Side quest. If the heroes speak to Tangletop either in person or via his persona as Spooky Wisp, the brownie explains to them that he wants the shiny in the room to the southwest. He warns the heroes that a mean, beak-faced doll will try to stop them from getting the shiny but he promises that he'll tell the heroes three secrets he has learned about the area, if they bring him the shiny. Asked to describe the shiny, Tangletop frustratingly says, It's shiny! You'll know when you see it! Pressed further, he rolls his eyes and describes it as, A sparkling glowing tube that I want, want, want! The shiny refers to the bejeweled spyglass kept on display in Area A23. If the heroes retrieve and hand it over, the brownie reveals what he recently learned from the books here, as well as from reviewing the paintings in the hallway between here and the room where he spotted the eyeglass. First, this building used to belong to someone named Volok Arazne. Second, Volok was an apprentice to someone else named Belcora. 
And even though this Volok person seemed like someone who was mean and dangerous, Belcora seemed much worse. Finally, the spooky magic lighthouse can do more than just shine an eerie light. It can also shoot a beam full of ghosts. This description is based on Tangletop's interpretation of the lighthouse painting in Area A-22, but isn't far from the truth. Area A-20 Repair Storage Shelves laden with tools, lumber, and planks line the walls of this 10-foot square room. These supplies were used for upkeep throughout the upper works of the Gauntlet Keep. Volok formerly functioned as a head groundskeeper and managed repairs, considering such mundane tasks beneath his skills. He often called upon Belcora's other servants as needed for these jobs. Treasure Heroes searching this room discover a large silver key worth 10 gold pieces. This key unlocks the door to Area B2. Area A21 Stairwell Moss and fungus coat these tightly spiraling stairs that lead down to Area B1. From the state of the growth, it's obvious that no one has gone this way for a long time. Area A22 Hall of Portraits A series of four paintings hang on the northwestern wall of this hallway, although layers of mold and decay have severely damaged them. The paintings along the wall have sustained irrevocable damage over time due to moisture dripping down from the leaks in the roof. The first painting is enormous, nearly seven feet tall and almost as wide. It's a landscape painting that depicts the city of Absalom in flames, with ghosts rising from the city streets between the burning buildings. The picture's lower frame bears a bronze plaque that reads, so shall the fools suffer. The second painting is nearly as large as the Absalom painting, and it is in the same style, although its subject is different. This second painting depicts Gauntlight Keep as it appeared before its upper floors collapsed. The lighthouse rises above the stately keep into the night sky, with its beacon emitting a pale blue light in which ghostly faces sneer and grimace. Its bronze plaque reads, let the light shine forever. The third picture is a portrait that once depicted Volok, but is now totally shredded. Volok destroyed it after becoming a worm that walks. Its plaque reads, The Artist at Work. The fourth and final portrait is smaller and circular. It depicts a smirking woman dressed in a red gown with a high collar, an image of Belcora herself. Its plaque reads, Lady of the Light. Long ago, Volok scratched the following sentences, written in Aklo into the stone next to this last painting. I serve you still. You shall be avenged. Area A23. Lens Workshop. A moderate level 1 encounter. This once elegant workshop has fallen into shambles. Soggy strings of dripping moss hang through the cracks in the wooden domed roof above. Below it, a carpet of broken glass glitters dangerously. Workbenches and shelves, armatures and displays, all formerly used in crafting and repairing immense lenses for the lighthouse, lie in ruins. Only a bejeweled spyglass sitting on a display rack near the southern wall has survived the devastation. Volok caused most of this destruction. After Belcora's death, he hid in the swamp while he waited for the Rose Guard to leave. When he returned, he was filled with such guilt over his cowardice that he destroyed the workshop in a fit of fury. The layer of broken glass and shattered materials covering the floor makes it uneven ground, with an acrobatics DC of 11. A creature who falls prone while in this room takes one piercing damage. Creatures Volok created several constructs to aid him and his mistress in their day-to-day -day jobs, but the raven-headed, raven-winged, soul-bound doll he called Mr. Beak was his favourite. Neither the most powerful nor the most helpful, Mr. Beak held the soul of his devoted servant, a goblin named Vorbo, a fact that ensures the construct's place at Volok's side. Today, Mr. Beak remains abandoned here, waiting forever for a creator who moved on to other tasks in an entirely new body. Mr. Beak hasn't lost hope, and when the heroes enter the room, he stands up from the slumped mound in the room's center and asks in a warbling voice, Is Master Erasne coming back? Regardless of the hero's answer, 
Mr. Beak realizes none of them are its creator. It leaps into the air on flapping wings to attack in a frustrated fury and fights until destroyed. Mr. Beak is a unique variant of a soulbound doll with ungainly wings that he can nevertheless use to fly. He can therefore easily avoid the uneven ground in this room. Treasure the bejeweled spyglass was Volok's finest creation, apart from the lenses for the gauntlet. Even in his self-loathing rage, Volok couldn't bring himself to smash this treasure. The spyglass is the shiny that Tangletop seeks. If the heroes decide to keep it, the spyglass has a value of 20 gold pieces. Mr. Beak's sole focus gem is located in his back, nestled between his wings. The gem is worth 5 gold pieces, but might prove more valuable as a potential source of information if the heroes place it in the partially complete soulbound doll in area B2. Area A24, Old Pier, a low level 1 encounter. This old wooden pier has partially collapsed into the swamp, and the portion remaining above water looks ready to follow the rest at the slightest touch. The pier is just as dangerous as it looks, Anyone stepping onto it causes the entire pier to give way and fall into the three feet of water beneath it. The sucking mud beneath it is greater difficult terrain. Creatures. A single flicker wisp dwells amid the rotting ruins of this old pier. When it notices the heroes, it begins to glow and writhe, appearing alternatively as a string of flickering fireflies, or as a rippling ribbon of light just above the gaping hole in the pier. Anyone who steps into this section of the pier runs the risk of falling through, and the flicker wisp quickly attacks any victim who gets stuck in the mud. The flicker wisp is eager to sup on frustration and confusion. It doesn't retreat once a fight begins, even if it's outmatched. Area A25 The Gauntlet Coppola, a moderate level 1 encounter. Rows of black metal bars encase this circular chamber like a cage. Shimmering waves of force flicker between the bars and give the illusion that softly glowing glass encases this entire area. The floor to the north has an iron trap door, otherwise this room appears empty save for a human sized encasement of glass and iron that flickers and glows with an unsettling almost nauseating pale blue shimmer. Gauntlight's Lantern The lock trap door in the floor of this room leads down to area A11, marked as an F on the map. Creatures If the heroes enter this area after defeating the blood of Belcora Haunt in area A11 below, that blood has slithered and flowed over Gauntlight's lantern. As the heroes enter the chamber, it slides off the lantern and transforms into a ravenous blood-drinking vampiric mist which attacks at once, fighting to the death. This encounter can repeat as often as the heroes continue to trigger and defeat the haunt in area A11 below, but it doesn't occur more than once per night.